Hello, and welcome to Daily Space for today, November 13th, 2019. I am your host, Annie Wilson, and I'm here to bring you all the updates on all the rocket-related things. So, first up, we have SpaceX. You know, SpaceX, Elon Musk company. So they launched the second installation of the Starlink Constellation aboard a Falcon 9. Liftoff was Monday, November 11th, 2019 at 2.56 p.m. UTC carrying 60 Starlink satellites. And Elon Musk tweeted this image of Starlink vertical on the pad. Uh, there are a few firsts for this launch. Actually, two firsts for the launch. The first one is that the fairing was flown for a second time. And the second first is that this is the fourth launch and recovery of a booster. And according to SpaceX, each booster can be flown 10 times. Uh, rough seas prevented a catch, but the fairing halves were successfully pulled from the ocean. And here is an image of all the satellites before they were enclosed in the fair payload fairings and this is also the heaviest spacex payload to date 15,600 kilograms so for americans that's a whole lot of two liter bottles like a whole lot of two liter bottles it's actually 34 pounds um or 15.6 metric tons, if that helps you think of everything. Um, the reason this set of 60 is so much heavier than the first set of 60 is because of all the upgrades to this batch of satellites. All 60 have full KU and KA band antenna sets, as well as having slightly different construction to, in to ensure full demisability. That just means they'll all for sure burn up in the atmosphere instead of having pieces survive and either hang around in space as junk or fall back to the earth. The first batch of 60 only had KU at, uh, antennas mounted. Also, there's talk of upgrades to the safety maneuvering system, which would make them more fully autonomous in terms of collision avoidance. And that would be, that would mean that there would there would be no need to wait for ground controllers if data from other orbiting satellites is already available from the U.S. Air Force. Whew, whew, whew. So here is, it's kind of faint and hard to see, so let me pull out my pointer for you. So this line right here is one of the first images captured of this latest Starlink train. And yeah, a Starlink train was able to be seen after launch. Dave Dickinson captured the this particular image of the Starlink train passing over no Norfolk, Virginia that same evening of launch. The dog is not impressed by the, the thing. Um, reflection mitigation measures will be included on the next batch of Starlink satellites and going forward, um, but they haven't been implemented yet. And we have, I have a video for you too. And this was taken over Japan. And the satellites are, this is real time, so you'll see how slowly they move. Um, in this image, they're a little bit more spaced out. I don't, I don't think I can get my pointer back. Um, and they'll continue to space out over time, spread out over time. And um, SpaceX, with this launch, SpaceX is now in the number two slot for the number of working satellites in orbit, passing up Iridium, which previously held the spot with 106 satellites. It'll probably take another two launches of 60 satellites each to surpass Planet, formerly Planet Labs, for the top spot. Um, for those of you that are curious, Planet has 197 Earth observing satellites. Uh, right now, SpaceX has 117 working satellites. Uh, Iridium has 106. The Air Force has a mix of 98 classified uh, communications, Earth observation position, navigation, technology development satellites. Spire has 80 
five Earth observation satellites, and NASA has 67 science, Earth science, technology development, communication satellites, and that number includes the International Space Station. Um, and there they go, just kind of traipsing past through the sky. They, they are very, they do move very slowly. They can be observed by the naked eye, and there are places that are trying to predict when you'll be able to see the train um, overhead. So, if you're into satellite spotting, this is something that can only, um, this is something that you can totally do on your own. And as far as all of its impact on, you know, astronomy, I really don't want to get into that. There's a, there's a lot of people and a lot of controversy, and right now it's just kind of a wait and see, because hopefully the train will be, see, I can't even see the train anymore in this video. Um, hopefully the trains will disperse quickly and we won't have to worry about it too, too much. All right. So, and now for the launch video, um, Larry would ask how many the Russians have. I don't know how many satellites the Russians have. So here's the launch video. This is the first reflight of our fairies. Oops, that skipped way ahead. That's about where I wanted to go. And yes, rocket launches are loud. I'm afraid to bunt, uh... Well, can I just start up? I'm afraid to bump it too far forward in, in the event that we miss. So we're just gonna sit through the thing and I'm going to look for your questions. Um, Veronica asks, will Starlink flares be more common LBS, than Iridium flares? Go for I'm launch. not sure. I'm really not sure. Um, Hanny asks, would the Starlink trains be visible at dawn or dusk? Whenever they're visible, uh, whenever you, you can see seconds. planets, you should be able to see them. Um, Hanny is also asked, by the time they finish, how many of these would be visible at the sky at once? The visibility- <laughs> hey, 15 seconds. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off with gratitude to our veterans today and always go USA. Dog nine is pitching down range. Stage one cross is nominal. Power and telemetry is nominal. T plus 55 seconds into launch and we've had a on-time liftoff and a beautiful view of the Falcon 9 vehicle making its way to orbit. We are coming up in about 10 seconds here on max Q. That is the maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will see during ascent. We should be able to hear that call out. Vehicles experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. And there's that call out for max Q. Coming up next is a rapid succession of events, starting off with main engine cutoff, or what we call MECO, followed immediately by stage separation. That's the separation of the first stage from the second stage. And then seconds after, we'll be... There we go. So it skipped ahead to the booster landing. On the left, we have the burn. booster. And as you see, that entry burn has begun. Should go for another five seconds or so. Oh. Stage one entry burn shut down. And as you just heard, we had a successful shutdown of that entry burn. Okay, there we go. Let's try it. Oh, 
Oh, wow. Stage one landing burn. We don't have that video just yet, but that landing burn has started. Second stage is injured terminal guidance. Stage one landing leg deployed. It looks like we're not going to get video on the way down. Oh, but we have the drone ship. And... Wow. The Falcon has landed for the fourth time. Amazing. These boosters are designed to be used ten times. Let's turn it around for a fifth, guys. One more part. Wow. Fourth landing. That is super cool. So stage two, I believe uh, we have had Seco one. Um, we're going to enter a coast phase. Um, so to, before we do that, we're going to take... And here's the payload. And there's actually an... Uh, All right, we lost the video just there, but let's listen in and see if we have any word on the deployment. Starlink tension rod release confirmed. And as you just heard, we have had confirmation that the tension rods have been released. Let's see if we can get some video of that. That would be really awesome. There we go. Now, as they make their way off, next they'll start to slowly drift apart and then deploy their singular solar array pointed at the sun to begin charging their batteries. And over the course of the coming weeks, the satellites will use their onboard ion propulsion systems to raise their orbit to 550 kilometers, align into their orbiter, orbital planes, and properly space themselves out to providing internet coverage on Earth. And with that, that brings us to the end of our webcast for today. So, so um, yeah, I know that was a whole lot, but those are the three parts of you know, this launch that I know a lot of you will see and ask about. And since we didn't stream it, it is kind of cool to watch. So I'm going to go up and look for more questions regarding this because it's best to just not, um, otherwise it won't be as fresh in my mind and it may actually fall off the chat. Do, 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 do. Um, so Hannies had asked, by the time they finish, how many of these will be visible at the sky at once? Um, they actually won't be visible by the naked eye. Um, our eye collects light differently than satellites and cameras do. So 60 times a second, our eyes just dump all the visual data. It, our eyes don't stack light like just leaving a shutter on a camera would or just how a telescope would. Um, they, the problem lies more with the streaks that they would leave. So if you were to take, if you were to have your shutter stay open and take a picture of a moving object, your eye will see that, mo that object move consistently. You won't, you won't see any blur, but your camera will record a blur. And that's the problem that, you know, astronomers gathering data have to deal with. Those streaks are in their data. But there are algorithms that do remove that excess data that the algorithms are like, okay, this object is in the sky at this time. So we know that this point of light is essentially, you know, bad data or a bad pixel. Um, I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Um, so yeah, they won't, once they're at operational magnitude, as our instro says, you're not going to be able to see them. They're, they were, they'll be below a visible magnitude. Um, so, oh, Kerbal, I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten. Trust me. Larry asks, after the 10th landing, the get retirement for scrap metal? I really don't know what happens to the boosters. Uh, after the 10th landing. I really don't. I'm not sure if 
if they'll be scrapped. I'm not sure if they're going to be put in a museum somewhere. I could see the first one doing the 10, 10 launches and landings being put somewhere on display. So, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, so on to the next story, because, yeah. Yeah, there were three launches this week. So the second story, the second launch, was by Xpace, which is the commercial side of China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, which is a state-owned group. Uh, they launched the Xiling, Xiling 1 Gaofen 02 Alpha mission on a Quezhou Alpha or one Alpha rocket at 3:40 a.m. UTC today, 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 today. Um, yeah. So here is their launch patch, and the mission patch for this X Space mission. Wow, that was very uh, redundant. Go me and my script writing skills. Anyways, so the mission patch for this particular x space launch is in the shape of a hexagon with the rocket on the transporter erector launcher front and center. In the background, there are four stars, sorry, four stars, a satellite, and an astronaut holding a flag. The outline of the satellite is the, I just lost the pronunciation, is the satellite that was launched, the Xi Ling Gaofen 02 Alpha, which is actually the 14th satellite for this uh, Xi Ling constellation. Um, the four stars represent the number of launches that this particular rocket has made. And the astronaut holding the flag is part of the logo for our space, a Chinese sanctioned agency that covers aerospace news. Their logo was incorporated because the first launch attempt was live streamed in conjunction with our space. And a live stream is extremely rare for a Chinese launch. And the second launch attempt was not live streamed. Trust me, I looked. I, I really was hoping it would be live streamed, but they did not launch the, um, they did not live stream the second launch attempt. And here is a photo of the launch. You can't see the TEL, the transporter erector launcher with all of the um, exhaust fumes exhaust plume, excuse me, with the exhaust plume. Uh, this was a solid fuel rocket, so you don't get the super bright oranges and reds that we're used to seeing. And um, we do have some video. We totally have launch video of this. Reminder, rocket launches are loud. And just here's a close up of the launch vehicle. with people for scale. So you can see, you know, how big this is. They're load they're lowering it onto the TEL. Here they are, another shot of them loading it onto the TEL. Here's the transporter erector launcher. In the patch it's yellow, here it's dark green. Oh, that's cool. They test, they push one button and they know within 30 seconds if it all works. And here's the actual launch. Oh, that's all wind noise. There it goes. So yeah, I was pleasantly surprised because remember this took off within the last 24 hours. I was pleasantly surprised that there was um, some launch video. There's not 
a whole lot of images of debris and the one image I did find of debris I couldn't confirm if it was from this launch or not so I didn't share it so anyways within within hours of that launch at a different launch site at 6:35 a.m. UTC a China Long March 6 rocket launched the let's just roll with it Ningxia Ningxia Ningxia, that's what I'm going with. I'm sorry if it's wrong. Ningxia uh, one mission and it had five satellites on it. So here is a photo of the launch. This rocket does look very different from the x -Pace rocket. This is a liquid fueled rocket. So you do see uh, a bit of the yellows. It's a daytime launch. So it's harder to pick up some of the oranges and reds that you would see from the exhaust plume. And I will freely admit that this launch snuck up on me, so I don't have a lot of info. I do know that the five satellites are part of a commercial project for a remote sensing detection mission. These satellites could also possibly be used for a signals intelligence mission where data is gathered for use by the military, either for information gathering purposes, to know the capabilities of other nations, um, for defense, or as much as I don't like to say it, offense. And because it snuck up on me, I don't know the details of this launch patch. Um, and the filter is just filtering out the TEL. Look at that. My green screen is just like, nope. Anyway, so this was also launched from a TEL, a transporter erector launcher. So you see the rocket and the TEL front and center. I didn't have time to poke and see what the five stars were for, but given that we know that there are five satellites on this launch and it looks like they're orbiting the Earth, I'm going to go ahead and say that's what the stars represent. I'm not entirely too sure why the globe isn't focused on China and it's rather focused on um, the Atlantic Ocean. You can see Europe and Africa and North and South America. You can't see China at all in that globe. And I can see three leaves in the background, and I don't know what the three leaves stand for. So that is my best interpretation of this launch patch. And surprise, surprise, there's a video for this one too. Harry Pan. So it sounds like China might give SpaceX a run for the satellite title. Yeah, I probably should find out how many satellites are in orbit for all of the different countries and break them down. But because I really don't know, I just know the breakdown I gave you earlier was for uh, essentially American companies. But yeah, this launch snuck up on literally everyone, as Kerbal says. And that's all I have for you about this launch. So I have some other news because I was not expecting two rocket launches this week or three rocket launches this week. Um, oh, cool. Planetary Pan's like, I already got you. I already got you. All right. So next up for China, um, there's new footage of the grid fins that were on the Long March 4 Bravo from the November 3rd launch. So we talked about this a little bit last week and I mentioned how there were grid fins, but we didn't have a whole lot of footage. Guess what? There's footage. So it's going to show you the launch again.
and there's the grid fin. You can see the first stage just spinning, 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 because it's, it's coming back to Earth. Here comes out the grid fin. see it's uh, trying to steer a little bit. Here's the rocket first stage re-entering the atmosphere pretty much in a straight line. And that's pretty much where they cut it off. So um, here's an image that was posted on Chinese social media of people with the grid fin. Remember, people actually go out and look for the wreckages of these satellites. And I was impressed that this many civilians were able to get this close to a rocket or at least they look like civilians. Um, and that gives you an idea of the scale of the grid fin. Um, and here is a close up after launch. So this is relayed by launch stuff. An article posted by Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology states that each grid fin consists of 38 pieces and requires up to 526 welds to make a single unit. They are made out of titanium alloy and welded using laser welding technology. They also confirm that the fins used on the long march to Charlie rocket this year are made with a different process than the ones used on this flight. I thought this was interesting. I figured I'd share with y'all. All right, so on for another update. And this is regarding the Boeing test last week. So last week we reported that, um, we reported on the Boeing pad abort test that occurred on Monday, November 4th. In most respects, the test was a resounding success as Kraft performed perfectly as planned in all aspects of its flight, with one exception, the parachutes. Here's some terminology you need to know before we dive into what happened. The Starliner has three sets of parachutes, drogue, pilot, main. The drogue parachutes slow the craft before the pilot parachutes deployed <laughs> before the pilot parachutes open to help the main chutes deploy. Um, during the morning test at the White Sands Missile Range, all three drogue chutes were seen to deploy as, as planned following the five second 5.1 G burn of the capsule's engines, which hurled it over 1300 meters, so over a kilometer into the sky. The three pilot parachutes then opened as planned, intending to provide the force needed to deploy those large, heavy mains from their tightly packed storage modules that top the craft. However, only two of the main parachutes followed. Don't panic. The Starliner has actually been tested and designed to land safely with only two of those main parachutes deployed. While it wouldn't be a particularly comfortable landing for the astronauts inside the craft, they would survive the landing. A post-flight inspection of the drogue, uh, drogue and main parachutes revealed the cause of the failure, and there is some good news. The third main parachute didn't deploy to a, due to a seemingly mundane and easily solved problem, human error. John Maholland, Boeing's commercial crew vice president and Starliner program manager, confirmed later that the lack of an adequate connection caused one pilot chute to deploy without pulling its main out behind it. Quote, the pilot chute has a Kevlar riser with a loop at the end of it. The linkage is a pin, so a pin would normally be inserted into that loop and secured. The linkage and the pilot chute riser are enclosed in a sheath, a protective sheath that prevents abrasion. So it's very difficult when you're connecting that to verify visually that it's secured properly. In this particular case, that pin wasn't through the loop, but it wasn't discovered in initial visual inspection because of that protective sheath." End quote. Carrie Leaders, man manager of NASA's commercial crew program, said that NASA NASA's usual process checks, which were not in place due to the purely testing nature of this flight, would have caught the error in an actual crewed mission. Quote, these are areas that we actually do process checks on. And with this being a test flight, there wasn't a process check here, but there's process checks that we have on our flight vehicles going forward because we know that these linkages are very, very important for the shoot to be working right, end quote. 
And an uncrewed version of the Starliner is currently undergoing pre-flight integration at the Kennedy Space Center in preparation for a cargo carrying test flight to the ISS next month. Whew, whew, whew. And this is a video from Stephen Clark of Spaceflight Now that has Nine, an alternate view. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One zero. Lift off. Pro complete. How about you cut off? Comment cut off. Pitch around. Forty kill parachute. There's the pilots. Or the drogues, rather. Drogue parachutes, mains. And there's the mains. SM7. Wow, it really does take some time for them to really fill out and deploy. Mains fully this reef. AC shield jettison. Airbags inflating. TM touchdown. Arnstra says it almost looks like the f one drogue didn't that didn't pull a pilot, which didn't then didn't pull it main. Peacock Juke asks, it has also has airbags, right? Yes, right. Hi Raj. Um Yeah, it that that was a lot. They did make it successfully. You know, it was a pretty much successful test. They had previously tested it with just two parachutes for you know, a failure like this. They didn't intend for the failure to be there, but yeah. Having redundancy is good. So with that, I am going to undock the lap dog and I'm going to go back and try to catch any of your questions I hadn't already. You ready to be undocked? She's like, I'm ready for Cheerios, mom. Yeah. All right. Okay. Oh, good. Um, the reefing is needed to keep sudden contact with the air from just shredding the mains. I, I don't know what reefing even means. I just know that they came out and then they went up. So I'm assuming that's what reefing means. That uh, bit where they're like this for a while and then slowly, you know, be like this. Um, which is cool. And yeah, yeah, I I don't think I would want them suddenly like this just for the uh, stress. Just from the stress. Okay, so while I look for your questions um, that I may have missed, I'm going to remind you that this is a production of PSI. It's Planetary Science Institute located in Tucson, Arizona. Working uh, in conjunction with Youngstown State University here in Youngstown, there's snow on the ground, Ohio. Okay. Uh, Larry, uh, regarding the uh, Starlink satellites, Larry asks, is the single solar panel for reflector mediation? Um, no, I, a second solar panel would make them really heavy and would add more weight and potentially make it more difficult for deployment. Uh, do to do. Astro B asks, hey, Annie, when will ordinary people be able to buy Starlink internet? Uh, from what I've read is early as 2020 or 2021. I'm not sure. It might be 2021. I would go with that year simply because if it comes earlier, you won't be disappointed. Um...
And there's a chart with more things, so let me Nine. Stop, stop, Eight. stop. I didn't I didn't do that for you to, to do your thing. So there's a chart with more satellites, so give me one second and I'll see if I can pull that up for you guys. Sometimes things get a little wacky when I uh, start changing things around. Oh, perfect. So here is satellites by countries and organizations. This is by N November to uh, YankeeOscar.com. And let's see, we were asking about China. China and Brazil combined have three China, I think, where is China? Just China, China. I don't know. They may have broken China down. Oh, here we go. People's Republic of China. They have 371 satellites total. I don't think that's broken down by Beidou and um, all the different little constellations that sometimes have commercial uh, properties. So the United States has 1,836 satellites total right now. So yeah, it, and we had divided that down by, uh, const or yeah, by company. Oh, and the Commonwealth of the Independent States, former US S USSR, has um, 1,000 or had 1,522. I, I don't know how Commonwealth of Independent States is defined. So that is what Planetary Pan shared. Let me pull chat back up again. Um, yeah. Uh, Kerbal on the chi Chinese grid fin says, oh, it survived. Hanny adds, wow, I thought it would be one piece. No, I was surprised it was like 500 and some welds. And I thought that was cool, which is why I shared it. Um, yeah. Do, 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 do. I, I'm not sure what they're going on about. Oh, shareable. Oh, the discover set. Okay. I don't know what's going on with the Discover set. Planetary Pan doesn't know what's going on with the Discover set. Mm. Do, 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 do. I'm scrolling. I'm almost caught up. Um, Larry Weird asks, how many Starlinks can a Starship cargo launch? I'm not sure, and I think they are actually talking about potentially using um, reusable spacecraft to launch more satellites. I really don't know. I really don't know. Uh, Larry says, yes, Aerokoth. I am going to leave Aerokoth or MU 69's new name to Dr. Pamela because that is definitely more astronomy than it is rocket news. It's definitely more astronomy than rocket news. Um, and um, Kerbal says that Gwen said 400 Starlink per BFR. Wow. Frida says, Doggo! Hi, Frida, you must be new here. Yeah, I throw Cheerios at the dogs and. Uh, they, they do that. Um, 13 out of 10. Yeah, there's two doggos. And I'm throwing Cheerios to, to appease them. So, uh, beat me up with facts. I'm trying. So I think that's, I, that's all the news I have for you guys. Does anybody have any questions? I know Rocket News can take a bit longer than you know the astronomy news because sometimes it's it's um sometimes we have weeks where i think it's going to be slow and i'm like eh, i don't need a bunch of extra stories and then surprise rocket launches happen so 
Oh, thank you for the bits, Trucker Kev. And make it rain. Speak. <laughs> Good girl. Oh, okay. Freda says they are they like the yum yum circles. They sure do. Oh my goodness. Oh, thank you for the sub, Veronica. Tinker speak. <laughs> Good girl. Make it rain. You see Puck, but you're hearing Tinker. Yeah, Hanny, they were totally ninja launches. I was really hoping that the um, Kilo Z, the X Pace launch, was going to be live streamed again, and I, they, I, I couldn't find it, couldn't find it until I finally found a whole bunch of, you know, communication that they weren't going to live stream it again, which I was bummed out by. But I understand. Uh, Larry Weird asks, are any of the one generate one generation spaceships of Orion, Starliner, Dragons have a toilet on board. I think they will. I don't know the details yet. Um, it tends to be part of life support systems, kind of. Um, oh, new generation. Um, I think they will. Even if it's uh, something that's more akin to the toilets that are on Soyuz, which for those that don't know, the toilets on Soyuz are not toilets you sit on. You straddle it like a horse or a broom or a motorcycle or a bicycle. It's, you straddle it. You, you don't, you don't sit on it. Um, it might be more like that. I'm low key hoping that it's more like that simply because we know the Soyuz toilet is that design um we know it's super reliable i would not be um i would not be upset if we did just buy the soyuz design and use that because we know it works um broken symmetry asks how many patches do i have on that nasa jacket none well other than the nasa patch just just the nasa patch it says rocket um scientists on the back i i may like this jacket um are you hopeful that apollo 11 will make it to the moon back you mean the artis artemis the first artemis mission um we should make it to the moon and back we really should and yeah, even a Soyuz toilet is better than a diaper or a bag or anything. The Soyuz toilet uh, is what essentially enabled females, women, to be in space because the urine disposal methods that were used by the Americans were not um, were not compatible with female anatomy. They just they weren't. They weren't. Uh, Raj Luthra asks, what are your thoughts on aerospike engines? I don't even know what that is. And Larry's already got a raid suggestion. Works for me. Um, I don't know what aerospike engines are. Uh, Arnstro does, though. And Arnstro says they have great potential, but in practice have material engineering issues. Right now, I can tell you what I've been researching this week. This week, I've been researching the number of windows in space. <laughs> And I'm trying to figure out how many doors and tables are in space. I know there are four toilets in space. The reason why I'm doing this research is because of my niece. Because she is preschool age and she knows for sure that there are four potties in space. But she has turned it around and asked me things like, How many tables are in space, Tia? How many doors are in space, Tia? How many windows are in space, Tia? And I'm like... I don't know the answers to these questions. I just know about the toilets. So this week I worked on how many windows are in space and the answer is around 38. And I do not count the cupola as all one window. It has seven different panes. Each pane faces a different direction and has its own um, shutter. If they all face the same direction or they all, if it was all flat, I would count it as one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hanny says, space cathedrals will need many windows. It would actually be pretty cool. Um, it would actually be pretty cool if there were, you know, stained or colored glass, but it would also interfere with 
you know, the practical use of the windows, which is being able to see what's going on outside without going outside and being exposed to space. So Ernstra says, next project, counting telephones. No, no, let me get through the tables and the doors first. I know that there's over a hundred laptops on the ISS. I have useless space facts. Uh, Veronica says, LOL, laptops would be hard to count. On Wikipedia, there's totally a tally of how many laptops. I don't know if it's current. I don't know if that's current, but it's the number of laptops that have been deployed to the ISS. So I don't know. These are weird rabbit holes. I never thought I would go down. Weird rabbit holes. So um, Larry says lead glass might be nice to stop radiation. The radiation that they experience um, doesn't need to be stopped by lead. Uh, we talked a little bit, was it last week or oh, was it last week or the week before where they were talking about having, oh, it was the Allen Bean, Bean launch. And I think we didn't talk about it during Daily Space, but I think it was mentioned um, during the launch stuff and some of the pre-launch stuff. And it it's a, a vest that has a bunch of polymers in it that is designed to um, protect the human body, particularly, you know, vital organs from radiation. And they didn't, um, I'm trying to think. They talked about why they use polymers instead of lead. And essentially lead was overkill for the type of radiation that they were trying to prevent. Also, lead is heavy and, you know, exposure is not something you want to. So, yeah. Um, Susie says, these are good barbet questions. I look forward to, I would not be surprised if I go to an astronomy on tap and be like, this is my presentation. Not who wants to do space trivia with me. Uh, Larry's talking about a flute that was on the ISS and Broken Symmetry is asking about a guitar. Um, I would assume that musical instruments, unless they were purchased for that exact purpose to be taken up to space and left there. Um, I would assume that they were not left up there. Uh, musical instruments tend to be very personal. Depending on your amount of disposable income, they can, and the quality of the instrument, they can be very expensive. Plus, a lot of times they have sentimental, sentimental value. And, I mean, honestly, I could see a guitar that's been to space and back as a collector's item, and I would not be surprised if it ended up in a museum or something. So, Arnister says about leaded glass. Leaded glass has traces of lead for retaining the minerals that provide color. They have nowhere near enough radiation, enough to reduce radiation by much. Uh, Veronica Cure says, someone was talking about aluminum windows recently. Yes, there's transparent um, aluminum windows. Kerbal says, broke. SpaceX was the first to reuse a payload fairing. Woke. The space shuttle was a payload fairing. Bespoke. Dream Chaser is a payload fairing in a payload fairing. Whoa, man. You're, you're kind of right, Kerbal. Holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. Raj says, I know of one university creating radiation shielding by creating a magnetic field. I can actually believe that. Tinker, you're sitting, but you're not sitting in the right place. I, I actually believe that. So, um, Gem Doctor says, transparent aluminum is better known as sapphire. Oh, really, Guido? Okay, Guido has a correction for me. Um... Guido says, I remember Chris Hadfield saying that the guitar he brought up is still there. It was specifically built by a Canadian company for that. Okay. Okay. Like I said, specifically purchased, built, whatever for space makes sense. But taking a personal musical instrument up, I, yeah. 
yeah, I, that is a very happy correction that I think a lot of us are are excited about. Because I I'm not surprised that there's a guitar. I could see. I wonder if astronauts try to learn guitar while they're up there. Not that they have a lot of downtime, but still. But still, be like, oh yeah, I know guitar. Larry says it's time for a clarinet in space. Um. Oh, that. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder how microgravity would affect playing a clarinet in space because the the reed has to be usually has to be wet. Um, so yeah, her instrument books Annie for the cr third dragon crew dragon mission. Oh my, I don't know. I don't know about all that astronaut training. I don't know about going to the bathroom in space. I know I talk a lot about space toilets. I don't know if that's something I actually want to experience. I don't know if I want to experience like space sickness and the more research I do on all of this, the more respect I have for the people that actually go up. <laughs> and they're super excited to be up there. Great for them, but I, I don't think that's for me. I, I don't think that's for me. So, um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Hard to form a marching band in space. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that would be tricky. I'm sure somebody would make it work though. I'm sure somebody would make it work. Oh my. <laughs> Y'all are too much. You really are. So, uh, I'd already forgotten who Larry said we should raid. So I'm gonna see if I can scroll up and find it. I think it got lost. Oh, no, Wolfram, okay. Let's see if I can just type this up. There it goes. I see it. If you march in one of those spinning habitats, there's no end of the road, infinite marching. No thanks. All right, got it. I don't know what Stefan Wolfram's doing today, but we're gonna raid Stefan. Um, I'm gonna roll the credits and all that other awkward thing that I do. So everybody, thank you again for tuning in. Today's script was written by uh, David Blard and myself. We are produced by Susie Murph. And the whole thing is a production of PSI, Planetary Science Institute, 501c3 nonprofit corporation. We are brought to you by you. Seriously, we could not do this without you. Why aren't they rolling? <sighs> Anyways, the credits aren't going to roll, so I guess we'll have to do this manually. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're brought to you by you. So thank you to everybody that's donated, bits, uh, subbed, bought merch, pledged on Patreon. Thank you to everybody. We literally could not do this without you. Um, since the credits aren't working, I guess I have to do all of this manually. So thank you, Wayne and Broken Symmetry, Kevlar, Trekker Kev and Veronica for the bits. Thank you, Veronica, for resub or for resubscribing. Thank you to Hack45 for the follow. Thank you, Wayne, again for the uh, $13 donation. Thank you so much. Um, Y'all are awesome. And I believe Dr. Pamela will be here tomorrow. And yeah, so until next time, wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful insert time of day here. Bye.